pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for this morning, Bakari Sellers. Bakari Sellers made history in 2006 when at just 22 years old, he defeated a 26-year incumbent state representative to become the youngest member of the South Carolina State Legislature and the youngest African-American elected official in the nation. In 2014, he was the Democratic nominee for Lieutenant Governor in the state of South Carolina. His impressive list of accomplishments, in addition to having served on President Barack Obama's South Carolina Steering Committee during the 2008 election. Mr. Sellers is widely considered to be a rising star within the Democratic Party and leading voice for his generation. That coupled with his uncommon ability to reach across the aisle and get things done has led to numerous accolades, which include being named Time Magazine's 40 Under 40 in 2007, as well as 2014 and 2015, the Route 100 list of nation's most influential African Americans and has provided commentary and analysis to CNN and MSNBC, including multiple appearances on the TV shows Hardball with Chris Matthews and Morning Joe. He now currently serves on the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, National Council. Bakari Sellers practices law with the strong law firm LLC in Columbia, South Carolina, and is a pol political commentator at CNN. He is married to Dr. Ellen Rucker Sellers. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in giving a big Spartan welcome to Mr. Bakari Sellers. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It is a privilege and a pleasure and every other adjective possible to describe how I feel about being here with you all this morning. I am uh, happy to say that I agree uh, with the president of this illustrious institution. Uh, Seven o'clock breakfasts are a little early. <laughs> we may want to move to a Founders Day brunch. Uh, <laughs> you know, I am from uh, the big city of Denmark, South Carolina, where we have, don't laugh at that, <laughs> where we have three stoplights and a blinking light. Um, and my mom and dad always taught me that the two most important words in the English language are the words thank you. Um, and they're not nearly said enough. And so I want to begin by saying thank you um, to this Norfolk State family. Uh, for having me here on this day. Today is uh, actually a really big day uh, for me. Um, I actually released my, my new show this morning. It's an Apple podcast, so please uh, go, and if you have a Samsung, Google Play. And my first guest uh, is none other than the person who I feel should have been President of the United States, Secretary Hillary Rodham Clinton. Um, and so it's an amazing opportunity. And it's just been a great week because I will tell you that I actually uh, share a birthday with Norfolk State. And so it's kind of amazing how the stars align. <laughs> this morning I am going to treat you all like Elizabeth Taylor treated all seven of her husbands. <laughs> and that means I'm not going to keep you long. But I do think that there are many things that we can discuss. Last night I was on TV talking about this new push to repeal and replace Obamacare and talking about a UN speech that the 45th President of the United States gave. And when thinking about my remarks this morning, I said that I don't want to talk about any of those things. Instead, I want to have a conversation about us. I want to have a moment of introspection. I want to talk about a journey to excellence. I think oftentimes we forget our journey. We get caught up in the fast pace of life and think that life is just a singular step. But for the purpose of this discussion this morning, we're taking a journey, and the destination of that journey is excellence. And so I apologize beforehand for bombarding you with questions that are rooted in such simplicity, but I think they're necessary to answer as we navigate and take this journey to excellence. The first is how far have we come? It's a question that everybody must ask. This university must ask itself that. No matter what you're doing, if you're playing basketball or even in the classroom or preparing for the MCAT or the LSAT, whether or not you're at work or trying to become a better father or a better husband, you always have to take a moment and ask yourself a very simple question, how far have I come? 
And the next question that we'll answer is, where do we go from here? So in answering the first question of how far have we come, I think it's necessary that we use some historical context. And for me, I like to think about 1946, where there was a young man named George Elmore. And George was so fair-skinned that he could pass as white. And so George had the audacity to go down to the local voter registration office and decide that he was going to register to vote in 1946. And because he could pass, they said, OK, go ahead. Here's your voter registration. And in the first Democratic primary that August, George went to the polls and said, I'm here to vote. And the poll worker said, we know who you are, George. You're a Negro. You can't vote. And pushed George aside. And George said, that's OK, because I'm going to be back. And George Elmore filed a lawsuit, which was known as Elmore versus Rice in 1946. But George was a unique character at that time. He was an entrepreneur. He had a five and dime store. He had a liquor store. At night, he drove cabs and actually was a photographer as well. And so during the pendency of his lawsuit, distributors stopped sending products to his five and dime store. His liquor store was firebombed. Crosses were burned in his front yard. His wife was terrorized so much that she had to be institutionalized. And George Elmore, he literally died a very, very broken man. However, due to George Elmore's sacrifice and Elmore versus Rice, that is the reason that African Americans can vote in primaries in the South. For me, I think about 1949 when parents of young African-American children in a small place called Clarendon County, South Carolina, decided that they wanted their kids to have the same opportunity as white kids because white kids could ride the school buses and black kids had to walk. And so these parents got together, Harry and Eliza Briggs got together and said, we're going to file a lawsuit with the help of the NAACP. It was known as Briggs v. Elliott, and Briggs v. Elliott was the first case filed in that landmark case of Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas. And you think about that, it said segregation causes a sense of inferiority by placing children in environments not conducive to learning. And you think about that very simple question, how far have we come? And then, for me, I think about one of the most amazing ladies that history has ever written about that many of us have just turned the page on because in 1955 there was a young uh, hotel worker. Her name was Sarah Mae Fleming. And see, Sarah was an awesome lady. She was, she was young. Sarah was about 22 years old. And she had just gotten off work and she wanted to go and ride a bus. You know, this story sounds familiar. She wanted to go get on public transportation. And she sat down in the front of the bus, but that was not her sin because the bus driver told her to get off the bus. Her sin was actually leaving through the front door because that wasn't the door that Negroes walked out of. And so the bus driver punched her in the stomach, rolled her down the steps. And see, the most amazing part about that is Sarah didn't want to be a hero. She didn't expect to get off work that day and stand up for so much, but she ended up being placed in that moment at that time in history. And Sarah got with the NAACP and filed a lawsuit, and without a woman named Sarah Mae Fleming sitting down first, there would be no Rosa Parks. So think about this very simple question that we have to ask ourselves of how far have we come. We live in communities where our kids are still punished because of the zip code that they're born into, so they go to schools where their heating and air are falling apart, their infrastructure doesn't work, their teachers are overworked and underpaid. Ask yourself that very simple question, how far have we come? We live in communities where we fundamentally have environmental injustices. Flint, Michigan still doesn't have clean water. East Chicago, Illinois is still suffering from polluted soil. Ask yourself a very simple question, how far have we come? How many of y'all go to church on Sunday? And y'all know the ladies who sit in the front three rows with the big hats? When you hug them, you smell like Chanel number no. five all day long. <laughs> They're always there for you. They cook after service. But see, what we don't understand is that on, 
on Monday morning, they have to make decisions about whether or not they're going to get their prescription drugs or pay their utility bills. And the reason being is because the trap of impoverishment has placed its grip on both our newborn and elderly alike, and escaping the trap of impoverishment has become synonymous with the proverbial dog that chases his tail. So again, ask yourself the very simple question, how far have we come? And to our lovely Miss Norfolk State University, I will dare tell you that in my 33 years of great wisdom, I have come to the resolve that the answer to the question, how far have we come, is that we've made progress, but we still have yet a ways to go. So now let's pivot and ask ourselves the next question, which is where do we go from here? Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., in one of his best books, I think it's actually his second best piece of writing behind the letter from the Birmingham jail, but his best book was where do we go from here? And he gave us two choices. He said we can either have chaos or community. Now we can't help but look around us, and in, especially in this community where we have so many of our loved ones and so many people we come in touch with every single day that serve our great country. And we can't help but to see with people throwing around words like rocket man and these very juvenile insults, except you're not playing with fish, you're playing with nuclear arsenals. The danger that comes with that and you read the newspaper and you see the markets are going up and down and you see that you have hurricanes that are devastating the, the, the Caribbean, you have earthquakes which are devastating Mexico. You can't help but to believe that we're on the brink of chaos, but the challenge for everyone in here under the sound of my voice, those of us who are young and those of you all who are young at heart, is we have to learn how to build community. Let me tell you a story. There was a young man who was born at 633 Frederick Street in my hometown of Denmark, South Carolina. And he went to Voorhees High School, as it was known at the time. And after he graduated from Voorhees, he went to Howard University. And there's a little bit of irony in this story, because after he got to Howard University, he befriended a man named Stokely Carmichael. The irony is that Stokely graduated from Howard, but then convinced this young man from Denmark to drop out of school. And so he did, he dropped out of school. He became a member of SNCC, or the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And before Freedom Summer, they all went to Miami University of Ohio to do training. And then they got that call that three of their colleagues were missing. And so this young man from Denmark, his first mission was to go to Philadelphia, Mississippi. How many of y'all have ever been to Philadelphia? Philadelphia, Mississippi is the size of this room. <laughs> it, that's all it has is a gas station. But their task was to look for the bodies of three of their fellow slain civil rights workers, Goodman, Schroener, and Cheney. And during the day, they would hide in barns and sheds, and at night, they would go out and look in ditches and trenches. Ironically enough, these bodies were found behind the home of one of the local sheriff deputies and ministers at the time. And that was this young man from Denmark's first indoctrination into the civil rights movement until he became a part of the most deadly civil rights demonstration that this country has ever seen. You see, the night of February 6, 1968, the students at South Carolina State College decided they were going to protest what the history books call the last vestige of discrimination Jim Crow's final hiding place at the All-Star Bowling Alley in downtown Orangeburg, South Carolina. And so the students went and they began to clap and chant and sing protest hymns and state troopers and city police begin to surround the students and the, 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 the uh, bowling alley sits in a right angle and as they surrounded the students, they pressed up against the students and the students pressed up against the glass and as the students pressed up against the glass, the glass broke and all hell broke loose. And city police and state troopers, they began to beat many of the students, but they beat them not with normal police batons, but they beat them with batons that were about this long, and at the end they had these leather rawhide whips. There's a young woman named Emma McCain who tells a story about watching one of her friends being held by two state troopers while another one beat her. And the students that night, on the night of the 6th, they had to go back to their campus, and they had to heal not only their physical wounds, but their emotional wounds and mental wounds as well. And then came February 7th, 1968. Um, older people say, uh, I think the saying is, the tension is so thick that you can cut it with a knife. Uh, for my younger people in here, it's kind of like um, 
I guess when you play in Virginia State and you're in the parking lot and you feel like something about to pop off. <laughs> That's how the tension was. <laughs> but nothing happened. And then came that fateful day of February 8th, 1968, when the students from South Carolina State, they went back to the bowling alley, but this time when the police came, they got the right idea. And imagine they went back to their campus and it's February in the South. And so it's not freezing, but it is cold. And so they built this huge bonfire. And as the sun set, the embers illuminated the darkness and the warmth from the fire. It got rid of the chill on your bones ever so much. And as they began to clap and chant and sing protest hymns, South Carolina State troopers lined up along the embankment in front of their beloved campus. And then for eight seconds, 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 4, 5, 6, Seven, eight, shots were fired into the group of students, but not rubber bullets or tear gas, but deadly double-eyed butt shots are the same bullets we use to hunt deer. Three students were killed, Henry Smith, Samuel Hammond, and Delano Middleton, and another 29 were wounded. A young man from Denmark was actually shot in the shoulder that night, and when he got to the infirmary, they told him there was nothing they could do for him there, he had to go to the hospital. And when he got to the hospital, Irony again, he was pointed out by the only black sheriff's deputy in Orangeburg County at the time, and he was arrested. He was arrested because he was deemed to be an outside agitator because he was the national field director for SNCC. And as he was charged with five felonies, looking at a maximum of 75 years in prison, and in between the night of February 8, 1968, and his trial a few years later, all eight, nine officers who fired shots into the group of students, it's amazing, history repeats itself, all eight, nine officers were found not guilty. But this young man from Denmark, he went to trial. And when he got there, the lead investigator said that he had misplaced the evidence. But he did remember this young man from Denmark, not on the night of the 8th, but the night of the 6th, standing on top of a fire truck, lighting a bick and saying, burn, baby, burn. And so his indictment was backdated from February 8th to February 6th, and he was charged, tried, and convicted of rioting, and he became the first and only one man right in the history of this country. But if you look at him today and you see that his eyes don't pop like they used to from shedding so many tears, as so many people in this room are of that Emmett Till generation and losing so many loved ones along the way. And you see that his shoulders don't stand as upright as they once did from carrying the burdens of so many generations, and you ask him, What's the greatest sacrifice he had to make? He'll tell you the greatest sacrifice he had to make was not being in jail or even being housed on death row per se, but it was being in jail for the birth of his oldest daughter or my big sister. Uh, because this young man from Denmark who grew up into a civil rights hero is my father, Cleveland Sellers. And you see the lessons that I learned from people like him and Henry Smith and Samuel Hammond and Delano Middleton and Emmett Till and Medgar Evers and Jimmy Lee Jackson and Septima Clark and Majeska Simpkins is that the answer to the question, where do we go from here, lies fundamentally in the ability for us to do one thing. Well, two things. The first is dedicate ourselves or rededicate ourselves to the proposition, especially now during this time, of loving our neighbors with a caveat. You must love your neighbors even when they don't love you. The second thing is we have to believe in this concept that I call dreaming with your eyes open. And it's never too late to begin to dream with your eyes open. Let me tell you what that looks like. Because y'all didn't bring me all the way down here to leave you with some rhetoric and then go home. When I was 20 years old, I had just graduated from Morehouse College. I came downstairs. I had a lot of swag at the time. <laughs> And I'll never forget, my mom was cooking spaghetti and my dad was flipping through newspapers as he always does and I told him I was going to run for the South Carolina House of Representatives. I was going to announce on my 21st birthday I was going to run against Thomas Road, who was 82 years old and had been in office for longer than I had been born. And my mom said she'd vote for me and my dad said he'd think about it. <laughs> and so I went out and I knocked on 2,600 doors and I had this conversation with Cory Booker because apparently in New York, in Newark, excuse me, people live on top of each other in these big things they call projects. 
We don't have those down where I'm from. So you knock on a door, you drive a mile, and you knock on another door. On June 13, 2006, we actually made a little history, but um, in becoming the youngest black elected official in the country, something crazy was going on around us. There was a presidential election. And so I was getting phone calls from Hillary and Bill Clinton, Dennis Kucinich, John Edwards, Joe Biden, Chris Dodd, Barack and Michelle Obama. Everybody wanted me to endorse them to be president of the United States because South Carolina is the first primary in the South. And so I narrowed my choices down to two people, Barack Obama and John Edwards. And I'm really glad I made the right decision. <laughs> and so I'm getting all these phone calls. And finally, uh, how many students do we have in the room? Raise your hand. This is not a part of the speech, but this is a PSA. It was, I got a, a phone call from a private number, and I will tell you that if someone calls you from a private number, it's one of two people. Either it's somebody very important, or it's a student loan company calling to get their money back. <laughs> so you just need to know that when you answer. And so I, I, I picked up, and they said, do you have time to speak to Senator Obama? I said, of course. We had met many times before. We had done things together earlier. He said, now is the time I want you to endorse me to be President of the United States. Mind you, I am about to walk in the constitutional law class. I'm the only state legislator with a book bag. And so I'm sitting there, and we're talking. And I say, I will under two conditions. One, my mom gets an opportunity to work on the campaign. And two, you have to come to my district. He said, done and done. And so a few weeks later, after I've traveled and done a few things for the president in places like Ohio and Florida, well, then, Senator, I get a phone call. They say. Uh, the senator wants to come to your district. And then I ran into a problem because I'm from a small town and we couldn't put the president at Voorhees College. <laughs> so I said, you know what, we'll do it at South Carolina State University and we, we will put him in the gymnasium named after Henry Smith, Samuel Hammond, and Delano Middleton. And that day, I'll never forget it, I had my own state house security drive me down. And you can imagine just being in your Norfolk State gymnasium with Barack Obama in town, but this is at the height of Obama mania, people are coming from Alabama and Tennessee, North Carolina, traveling from miles around just to see him. And the stage is right in center court and there's metal guardrails around for Secret Service and the men's basketball locker room is our green room. <laughs> and there is metal guardrails leading out of the men's basketball locker room to mid-court where the stage is. And so when I walk into the green room, sitting down is Chris Tucker and Kerry Washington. And so me, Kerry Washington, and Chris Tucker are just chatting because everything in politics is late. And the president is running behind, and so we're then senators running behind. So one of my friends comes in and says, I'm going to run to the county airport. I'll be right back. And so Rick Wade ran to the county airport, and he came back with Usher. And so it's me, Usher. <laughs> this is literally a true story. I have pictures. <laughs> so it's me, Usher, Kerry Washington, and Chris Tucker waiting on Barack Obama. And finally, the senator gets there and they say, it's go time. And so I remember this because they're playing like ain't no mountain high enough. And I usually don't get great introductions like I got this morning when you speak around the world. And many times they have this thing called the voice of God, where they say, and now, welcome to the stage, Representative Bakari Sellers. And this is my home. I know everybody, mostly everybody in the gymnasium. And so I'm, you know, walking down and people are grabbing me and I'm autographing babies and just doing all types of stuff. <laughs> and finally we get to the stage and I'll never forget, I was talking about Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech, but not the rhythmic cadence that we always get caught up in, the rhythmic cadence of I Have a Dream that one day we shall, because I was talking about the most important part of that speech in which Dr. King talked about the fierce urgency of now. And then I turned around and I introduced Chris Tucker and the decibel level got a little louder, and Chris turned around and he introduced Kerry Washington. And it got a little louder, and Kerry turned around and she introduced Usher, and all the women started passing out. <laughs> and then Usher turns around and introduces Barack Obama, and it is so loud that it's like just the buzzing in your ear. And we're supposed to stand on stage while Senator Obama is speaking, but it's too crazy, and so he looks at us and says, we have to get off stage, but first he wants us to take this picture. And so we take this picture, and to my left is Chris Tucker, to my right, is the 44th President of the United States. To his right is Kerry Washington, and to her right is Chris Tucker. Excuse me, Usher Raymond. And so people ask me all the time, what was I thinking at that moment? And I tell them, I said that I was about 350 yards away from where my father was shot on that campus, and the blood of my family literally ran through the soil of my great state. I was about 19 miles away from where I had this dream that I could one day change the world even at a 
20-year-old or 21-year-old and run for office and win and help out people no matter what they look like or where they came from. And although I was only 350 yards away from that shooting and only 19 miles away from where I decided to dream with my eyes open, I had gone so far. And for me, that's the concept of dreaming with your eyes open, understanding that you don't have to be a certain age, you don't have to travel miles around the world, but you can literally change and dictate the future of your home simply with a dream. And so for me, I will tell you that as we take this journey to excellence and we ask ourselves the question, how far have we come? And we know that we've made progress, but we still have yet a ways to go. And then we turn around and we pivot and ask ourselves the question, where do we go from here? And we understand that we have to dedicate ourselves or rededicate ourselves to the proposition of loving our neighbors even when they don't love us. And then we understand that no matter how old we are or how young we are, we can also dream with our eyes open. I think that on this journey to excellence, if we do what the greatest educator of all time, with all due respect to all the educators in the room, I am talking about Benjamin Elijah Mays. He said, in all things that you do, you do them so well that no man living, dead, or yet to be born can do them better. For me, that is the definition of excellence. That is the journey that we're on. And when we get there, somebody somewhere will simply be able to say, job well done, my son. Thank you and God bless you all.